Okay, so we're now recording. So um, Jenny is going to present on helping students think about how they learn, integrating habits of mind into classroom teaching. Uh, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I am really excited about how many people are here with me today on reading day. Um, I was not paying attention when I said that this was a day I would be available, but hey, Sam, we should remember this for the future reading day popular for webinars. So as Sam said, I'm Jenny Dale. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the head of research, outreach, and instruction at UNCG Libraries. And I just wanted to start uh, by highlighting the description of this webinar. Um, so I'm going to be focusing on Art Costa and Ben Akalik's 16 Habits of Mind. Um, and in my description, I said that these habits do not refer to specific skills or behaviors, but to dispositions that we can help our students develop that facilitate deep and reflective learning. I, I feel like that's actually a little imprecise because we, we are ultimately in the end talking about a, a set of skills and behaviors or so sort of a pattern of skills and behaviors can be um, part of how we understand this idea of habits of mind. Um, so I if I do this presentation again, I might revise that a little bit, um, but it is not like a single skill or a single behavior. It's really this sort of a pattern like what we think of with our own habits that we might do daily. So I'm gonna be showing some examples or sharing some examples from my own teaching. And then I will be encouraging you to think about how you might integrate this into your own practice, whether that's teaching or training or you know some other way. I think one of the things about uh, the habits of mind sort of approach or framework is that it is very flexible. So again, we are going to be talking about habits of mind according to Art Costa and Ben Akalik. Uh, these are not the only habits of mind that have been identified or named by um, educators or educational scholars. They are just, it's my particular favorite set um, and one that I find that's really relevant to my own work. Um, so, but I do have some resources at the end that can link you out to some other um, habits of mind uh, sort of frameworks. And I will make sure that when Sam sends out the recording, she'll have a link to these slides. So Costa and Calic, I've mentioned them a couple of times. They are the ones who identified initially these 16 habits of mind. And they did it mostly with younger children, work with younger children in the sort of a K-12 environment. Um, but I find them to be, again, very applicable to the work we do in higher education. Um, and Costa in 2008, which is a while after they actually identified these, but this is a particular um, edited text, like an edited collection that I find really useful that I'm referring to today. And so this, this particular chapter was just written by Costa. And he says, they are the characteristics of what intelligent people do when they are confronted with problems, the resolutions to which are not immediately apparent. I feel really kind of icky about the word intelligent there. It, it, it stands out to me in a way that I don't like. Um, so I think that we can reframe this a little bit and just think about these characteristics. These are the characteristics of what people do when they are when they are committed to solving challenging problems. Um, and if you are um, familiar with Wiggins and McTie's understanding by design uh, framework, backward design instructional framework, um, I it's being kind of similar to uh, their essential questions. Um, so whenever I can think about this particular definition that Costa uses, I also sometimes just sort of reframe it in my mind as thinking about these are the characteristics um, that people use when they want to work towards under like to work towards answering these essential questions. Just that's just an aside if you're if you're also an understanding by design nerd like I am. Um, they acknowledge that their 16 are not the only ones. It's not a complete list. It's not the only list. It's not even the best list, but it is a list that they identified based on a lot of observation and research. Uh, one of the things that Costa says in this same chapter is that it's really important to note that these are not typically going to be like isolated habits. Typically, they're going to be I like this concept of clusters of behaviors that are drawn forth and used in various situations. This is a super long quote. Um, so that's part of why I tried to pull some ideas out using that darker red color. If you're able to see that again, Sam will send the link to these slides out and you'll be able to look back at this later. But some of the things that I really wanted to draw out here from this lengthier definition is this idea that a habit of mind is a composite 
right? So again, it's not an individual behavior or skill, but it's something um, that is, as it says here, a composite of many skills, attitudes, cues, experiences, proclivities, behaviors, all these kinds of things. It's a pattern. Um, and one of the things that is particularly important to me at, when I think about these habits is that they're, it's, as it says, sort of towards little past halfway here, it, using these habits or drawing on these habits requires a level of skillfulness. Um, and to me, that comes through practice, just like when we develop sort of maybe regular or daily habits in our own life. You know, if I floss once, it's not a habit, but if I'm flossing regularly or if I'm flossing every day, then that has become a habit to me. And it's because I have practiced it day after day. Um, and the other last bit here that's really important is um, that habits of mind, uh, engaging with them is it kind of requires the use of reflection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That's all leading up to this list of our 16 habits of mind that were identified by Costa and Calic. So I'm going to read through them, and then I'm also going to give you a PDF version that you can look at. Um, but they are actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do that first. I'm going to do that first and paste this into the chat, um, and it should open a PDF outline of these 16 habits so that you can reference that while I am reading them. So these 16 habits that Costa and Kallick have defined are persisting, managing impulsivity, listening with understanding and empathy, thinking flexibly, thinking about thinking or metacognition, and that's sort of how that reflection is really built into the practice of habits of mind. Striving for accuracy, questioning and posing problems, applying past knowledge to new situations, first half, thinking and communicating with clarity and precision, gathering data through all senses, creating, imagining, innovating, responding with wonderment and awe, just an aside that I think that's a pretty tall order uh, for many of us as teachers to help people develop that, but it's in there. Taking responsible risks, finding humor, thinking interdependently, and remaining open to continuous learning. So these, these are the 16 that they have defined. And I will just once more paste that link, which should take you to a PDF document that looks a bit like this. And I want to give you a moment to spend a little bit uh oh, I've, I've been signed out. Good timing. I'm going to give you a moment to spend a little time with this. Um, and I'm going to be asking you, let's see if I can get the slideshow back where I want it, to share in the chat, once you've had a moment, to share in the chat, which of these 16 habits of mind do you find most intriguing? And I'm being very specific about that word, which I'll explain in a moment. And so just Spend, spend a moment with that PDF um, and then share in the chat anytime you're ready, which of these you find most intriguing. Finding humor is popular so far listening with understanding and empathy, thinking interdependently. There are so many to choose from that I think this can be hard to. So for, for Leah, thinking many, many of them, yes, thinking flexibly, Candace says the same, so y'all are on the same page. Um, Lori says number one, which I think is, no, I'm thinking, let me, let me see. I forgot what number one is. Uh, persisting, so critical. How could I forget? Okay, still having some strange connection issues. Number three, listening with understanding and empathy, gathering data through all senses, taking responsible risks. Lois said responding with wonderment and awe. Um, Anna is struggle, struggling to choose, which is understandable. Again, they're just so good. Oh yes, Morgan, absolutely. And you'll see in my resources um, that I also have uh, some other kind of one pager PDFs um, that I will make sure that you are all uh, able to look at. Okay, so 
congratulations. You have all just responded to this concept with wonderment and awe. Again, that's one I find challenging because I think, gosh, how am I meant to foster wonderment and awe in, in my particular teaching situation? And really, one of the things that you can do is ask your learners, what's intriguing about this? Or like what interests you the most or what seems strange about this even um, there are some there are different ways that you can do it but I, I prefer the intriguing word because then sometimes people are intrigued in a positive way sometimes it's more neutral sometimes it's I'm intrigued in a negative way I think this is terrible and we can kind of explore that and then that's that's one way that we might be responding with wonderment and awe so I wanna to get to the idea of how we can teach with these habits of mind in mind. Uh, this is a different chapter from that same text. Uh, I do have a references slide that I'll make sure y'all are able to get to. Uh, when it comes to teaching habits of mind, Anderson and Costa say, build it into your planning process the same way you would your student learning outcomes or student learning objectives. They, again, I've pulled some things out of these lengthier quotes with the dark red, but we make the habits of mind an explicit outcome of our teaching. So it's really important to be intentional if you want to bring these into your teaching or training or other, you know, some other way that you do your work. And they mentioned specifically that they sequence a series of learning experiences designed to develop students' habits of mind so they can become the skillful and effective problem solvers that we would like them to be. And I just want to reiterate here, we've seen this concept of problem solving coming up in a lot of the quotes that I've brought in um, from the research. And that is really kind of at the core. If you are able to exhibit these habits of mind, you're going to be more effective as a problem solver. And, you know, that might not be something that is um, um, that we necessarily would tell uh, students as a way to get buy-in from them, but we could think about, you know, how can we even kind of promote this idea and why these habits of mind are actually important. And then uh, when they, they encourage you that when you are actually designing activities that are appropriate to do this, to encourage habits of mind, uh, they suggest considering first the two, the, the following two things, building into, well, Okay, creating cognitively demanding tasks and then building intuitive awareness. Um, and they say here at the end of this quote that these are all about um, creating the kind of learning space in which we are talking about, like explicitly talking about and uh, engaging with habits of mind. So uh, a quick note on my context before I give you a couple of examples of how I have intentionally brought these into my teaching. Almost all of the teaching that I do is in the form of one-shot library research workshops. So a 50 or 75 minute session where uh, a professor uh, and I work together, they bring their students to the library or we meet online um, and I walk them through some of the strategies that will help them um, typically to complete a research-based assignment. Um, so I don't, you know, sometimes I see those students again, sometimes they reach out to me for help, sometimes I don't, sometimes this is my one opportunity to really work with students, so I, I don't have uh, a semester to build a relationship with each student um, and, and help them really foster these across time, but I still wanted to use my examples just to show that even in a very limited uh, type of teaching situation like I'm in, I am able to try to promote these habits of mind. I just have to sort of focus on things like modeling and naming um, and then through short activities. So I'm going to give you a couple of these short activities right now or talk through them. Um, so this is a, a, I, with almost every class I teach, I open the class with some sort of reflective question that's really meant to activate prior knowledge. Um, and I think most of us, if we teach or we train, we know that that's a really important piece of the puzzle to help our learners really integrate new information. Um, so this one is really specific beyond just uh, activating that prior knowledge to the habit of mind applying past knowledge to new situations. So in this one, I ask students to think about a time when you have had to evaluate an information source in your personal life. How can you apply the strategies you used then to evaluate a source for your research assignment? 
And I typically do this as an individual, like anonymous uh, Mentimeter activity, uh, but it could also be a think pair share. It could be something that students talk to each other about. Um, and really what I'm trying to get at here is showing them that, you know, these, these two contexts actually overlap and you're able to apply what you've done in the past that's been effective to this new situation. The next one um, is for a 300 level communication studies class. I am the liaison to communication studies is one of my areas. And this class is, this is actually specifically for a communication theory class. Um, and one of the struggles that students have in this class semester after semester is that their assignment requires them to choose a communication theory and then apply it in a specific context. Um, and students are frequently very frustrated when they put in a, a search like this one that I have shown here that I would typically demonstrate in a class where they their theory is uncertainty reduction theory and their context or application is with college roommates and we get no results so students come to me frustrated like oh i was looking for expectancy violations theory for you know girlfriends and veterans and i can't find anything because there's typically not going to be that perfect source that does the exact same thing that you want to and so i like to demonstrate this and then i like to do a think pair share activity in which I ask students to talk to each other about what they think they would do next. Um, and I will often put a limit on it, which is you can't change your topic in this scenario. You've got to keep with your same topic. So how are we going to stick with it and then sort of reframe things? And so this is very specifically drawing on persisting and thinking flexibly, taking thinking flexibly in this case, meaning sort of uh, taking a different perspective uh, and being sort of creative with your thinking. And then finally, this is an activity I did recently uh, with a 300 level English course. Uh, they were, their assignment was all about looking at word usage uh, from a very specific time period in a database that I love called American Periodical Series, which is digitized periodicals. Um, so the activity that I had them work through was uh, that they were looking for an article that uses temperance, but with the specific definition of sobriety. So not just general temperance, but we're talking about temperance um, as it became known more so in the 19th century, which had a lot to do with abstaining from alcohol. Um, so asking students to find an article from that time period uh, that uses temperance in the way we I've asked them to find it. And the first several results, uh, I, I tested this ahead of time, the first several results use temperance, but not the way I wanted it to be done. So students had to kind of keep looking through their search results, uh, which is something that most of us don't like to do, not just, not just students. I think most of us are the same way. If the first thing I click on in a search result doesn't have what I need, I get a little frustrated. Um, so with this activity, I'm trying to promote managing impulsivity, not just choosing the first one and saying, I'm good, here's what I'll submit for my assignment or in this activity, and then also again, persisting. So in my context, I would say persisting is one of the ones that I try as hard as I can to build into my research workshops, because I think all of us here would probably agree that doing research requires a level of persistence uh, that really does have to be developed over time. So I am going to give you, all right, it's 1121. So we have a couple minutes with this. I'm gonna ask you to take a few minutes and to just think about how habits of mind uh, apply in your own teaching or training or whatever context you're in. Um, and then I want you to think specifically about which ones you already see some evidence of in your work and even start brainstorming a little bit about one new assignment or activity you could do in your in your work situation or your teaching situation to encourage learners to build one of the 16 habits of mind. And I will once again, pop that PDF link in there in case you lost it. Um, and I am just going to, we're just gonna do this individually. And I'm just gonna give you about three minutes right now to think through this. And if you wanna share something in the chat, that's great, but it is absolutely not required. This is really for you.
I've kind of forgotten how awkward these long silences are on Zoom, even when they're built in and meant to be long silences. Um, we have about one minute left, but if there is anything you would like to share in the chat, please feel free to do so. I'm going to give you about one more minute and then we will move on towards the wrap up. Thanks for sharing, Sam. I, I think that's a really good example if you're talking about with um, with thinking and communicating with clarity. Um, it, you know, for, for us as librarians, we have a set of jargon that I think it does require sort of a, a frequent uh, reiteration of what a term means in our context. And we're certainly not alone in that, right? We all in our all, all in our disciplines have a certain language that's necessary to be able to communicate things effectively. I also really like that people are sharing um, things that they uh, that they want to encourage both in themselves and in their learners or colleagues. So managing impulsivity, like Sam said, it's probably something we could all we could all work on a little bit. Um, and it is again particularly uh, kind of relevant for those of us who teach about information skills because uh, our instinct is always like first one's the best, right? Let's just take it and go. You know, I mean, even when I'm just googling something for information, if I don't like immediately see it, I get a little annoyed. Um, so remaining open to continuous learning, awesome. Um, Audrey is already seeing um, creative, imagining, creating, imagining, and innovating, try a different way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that is absolutely inherent in instructional design work. It doesn't really happen. Um, it, you know, it, instructional design doesn't happen well if we're not open to those kind of things. Helping people, uh, yeah. Well, and Audrey, you might have, because of your work with instructional design, you might have sort of a unique a unique kind of opportunity to be encouraging people to keep up with their learning in that way. I like that. Zoomed in on number nine for research consultations, thinking and communicating with clarity and precision. We talk through research projects. Um, yes, awesome, Leah. Matthew Lloyd, metacognition, such a big, such a big thing. This is something that I think many of us are are always wanting to build more into our work, especially when we're teaching. Um, we've got apply past knowledge, new situations, listening with understanding. These are amazing. I'm gonna make sure I save this chat so I can see some of these things, including some examples. Um Thanks, Matthew, for sharing that tilt framework. Um, I feel like I've seen it before, but I, I definitely want to be able to bookmark that. Okay, uh, I just wanted to give some examples uh, from the uh, from Minerva's academic curriculum or MAC. Um, in full disclosure, I was involved in the development of MAC. I was on the uh, revision task force one and two uh, that ended up with MAC. Um, but I realized as I was thinking about my research that I've done into habits of mind that I wanted, I, I had noticed some applications, particularly in our general education program, MAC. So this is one, thinking with thinking and communicating with clarity and precision. This is so important. Several of you mentioned this in the chat, um, but I see this all across, all over the MAC program. And I just have a couple of SLO examples here. The written communication SLO too, as one example, create and revise written texts for particular audiences, purposes, and context. All of that requires both thinking and communicating with clarity and precision. And I just, again, have a couple of examples through here. Um, if you are uh, interested in these, you will have the slides. Um, and also, if you're ever interested in just chatting about this, I will. I would love to speak with you. Um, another one, thinking flexibly. I see this in this global engagement and intercultural learning SLO two. Explain how similarities, differences, and connections among different groups of people or environmental systems affect one another over time and place. So this requires you to do some perspective taking um, and to be able to change the way you're approaching a particular concept. 
thinking about your thinking is again kind of all over the MAC curriculum. Um, but I pulled this one out in particular because for the diversity and equity third SLO, it's examine individual and collective responses for addressing practices of disenfranchisement, segregation, or exclusion. And on the rubric for this, uh, for actually for all the diversity and equity SLOs, there is a dimension that is all about examining your own positionality, and that requires a heavy duty metacognition, I think. Uh, striving for accuracy, of course, something that is super important, um, and I see this with, we have two different ones related to citations and source integration, and then from data analysis and interpretation, construct and interpret data tables, charts, graphs, or other representation. So those are just some examples. Um, wrapping up, uh, this is going to be your homework. Not that you have to turn it in or anything, um, but I am going to make sure that um, in the uh, email that Sam sends out, Sam, I will send you the uh, this per these prompts um, that can just be included in that email that goes out with all the other content. Um, but just want you to be thinking a little bit about um, whether your understanding of this concept changed over the course of the webinar and what led to that change or or why it didn't change, why you think it didn't change. Maybe you were just already an expert. Um, with what you know now about habits of mind, whether it's from this or from a combination of this and other sources, are they worth considering? Is it worth the time to take to put them into your instruction? So these are just things I want you to think about um, that integrate that metacognitive piece of kind of not just thinking about it, but then thinking about how you thought about it. Um, so finally, I am here to answer any questions. And while I am waiting for that, I will share with you uh, that I do have a number of selected resources that I will share. Um, I want to point this one out actually in particular. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask. But uh, while I am waiting for that, I want to show. So if you're a teacher, um, this particular, the Habits of Mind Institute has these contextualized handouts um, that have you explore these 16 Costa and Calic Habits of Mind in a teaching context. Um, so you, it goes through each of them um, in, in a different order than they are usually shown, but it goes through and I, I always really appreciate, um, it gives you some suggested prompts or ways that you might prompt this kind of um, these habits of mind. So I wanted to point that one out in particular. Um, I do also have my references here. Uh, so uh, that will be available to you in my slideshow. But yes, does anyone have any questions or comments or thoughts or resources they want to share, like the tilt that uh, Matthew shared? Y'all are welcome to put it in the chat or unmute. Um, I do want to note in the chat that I did put a link to a quick form to just let us know um, how Jenny did, how we did. And then um, we don't have the sessions for spring 2023 yet, uh, but stay tuned on the um, website or talk to your library liaison. Um, and if you have any ideas or something you want to see from the library on research and applications, definitely let me know either through email in this chat. Um, there's also an option to put that in, in the form. I hope what this means is that I have communicated effectively with clarity and precision. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that's true. Um, this is a big, I, I, a big idea. Um, I have done some research with librarians, particularly those involved in information literacy education, like I have been in my career, um, to uh, deal to ask them some questions about how this might work for them. All that data is like uh, sitting in. Uh, and now I can't even remember the name of the resource. It's a text analysis. Uh, Sam Sam has used it. Um, I have that data sitting there just waiting to be fully analyzed. Well, thank you all so much for these lovely comments. Um, and if you do ever want to talk about this, um, please do email me my email address here in the chat as well. Um, and I really would encourage you to think about the homework questions that will be sent out in that email. Yeah, thank you so much for that tilt framework. Um, I am, I'm excited to look back at that. I think I've seen it at like a faculty development conference before, um, but I'm always looking for a good framework.
Well, you're only getting praised, Jenny. Um, and I don't want to keep people here too long, um, though, you know, everyone loves praise, right? Um, so um, I'm going to like give it, I'm going to talk kind of slowly, um, but um, I would assume if people had really pressing stuff, they would have unmuted or put it in the chat. Um, so I'm going to slowly talk about ending this, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jenny, for um, presenting. I found this really interesting. I um, like hearing about the stuff in like my professional development, continuing my learning uh, with these kind of topics, uh, should I said. Um, yes, Matt said that he's been laughing in his office. Great. That's, I always say Jenny is good at being funny in her teaching. I, that is the greatest of compliments. That is a great compliment. Yeah. I always, if I have like one student laugh at one of my jokes, I'm like, yes, like, yes. Like, <laughs> so good. Um, usually I'm more chuckling at myself, um, but that's okay. Finding humor within yourself can also be a habit of mine. Okay. Well, thank you all. Have a great reading day. Um, Good luck to us all as we head into finals, the end of the semester. Um, I hope to see you all around campus or in the Zoom space. Um, and um, yeah, have a great December, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Jenny.